shall we go ahead and get started? We have standing room only for this wonderful event where we'll be learning from and with leaders of Formula One about how to manage and lead in a highly turbulent environment. And I have to say, um, before I share a few other thoughts, I keep thinking about this as I walk through the lobby with the cars out there. So I'm sad to say I've not been to a Formula One event. Who, who has? Can we see some hands? Axel? Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. So I'm clearly in the minority, but I have lived in both Indianapolis and Tennessee, and I do know NASCAR and the Indy 500. Um, I know, I know it's kind of at a lower level, but I, I think one of the things that obviously these, these efforts share, although obviously at a more sophisticated level with the F1, is adrenaline and the incredible power you feel at one of these events, but behind that power that you feel just by the speed is our remarkable teams, obviously in the pit crew, but also behind the scenes, leading incredibly competitive environments from the marketing and the finance. And so we have a very special opportunity tonight. And for those of you who, who might be visiting CAS and don't, don't know us as well, uh, to me tonight also is a perfect example of really the three engines that drive CAS. And I know that just sounds like a pun or overusing car analogies, but I use that term quite a bit. But, and it's about knowledge and education and community. And so knowledge, you, you may not know this, but recently the Financial Times ranked our corporate strategy group number eight in the world. I don't think that's shabby after out of what, 17,000 business schools? So people like Paolo and uh, then we get to bring our colleagues like Professor Jensen with us tonight and others. And then you've got the education piece, which is obviously very powerful. I know we have quite a few students here tonight. Um, we have now all of our globally ranked programs in the top 20 to 40 of the world. Uh, but then you look at that car, if you've noticed it out in the lobby, one of the cars, the smaller ca car, or the car that isn't taken apart, I should say, is the work of some students sitting here in the front row, wonderful to have you here, and a fabulous collaboration between business and engineering. And the mechanics and challenges of obviously the engineering side with the commercialization and business challenges obviously on the CAS side. So great example. And then the community. And the potential and power of bringing these groups together in a vibrant hub that is London and CAS. But it is those synergies that really let us have some adrenaline tonight and a wonderful, uh, exceptional group of both academic experts and industry experts of Formula One to really bring this topic to life. So with that, let's give the panel a hand and let me turn it over to Professor Paolo Reversa. Thank you very much to our Dean, uh, Professor Marianne Lewis, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here tonight. Good evening. And I'm very excited to be back with this event, uh, Compete in Turbulent Environment, lesson from Formula One. Uh, this is the second edition of this event. We've been running the first one uh, exactly two years ago. Some of the panelists uh, at that time um, that, that were there at that time are still today with, uh, with us, uh, Professor Mark Jenkins uh, and Joe Seward. And um, my name is Paolo Versa. I'm a lecturer in strategy at uh, CAS Business School, and I'm the resident uh, uh, nut about Formula One. Uh, I try to turn my craziness into some kind of interesting, interesting insights that I share with some of my students that are here, but also with people in the industry. So um, first of all, I would like to ask, what is Formula One and why do we talk about this tonight? Especially not in terms of sport, but more in terms of business and management lessons. And I thought, since this is a quite of a, I would say, silent event for being a motorsport event, because we're not going to turn on any of the cars, especially the one in parts that is provided by our partner, Scuderia Toro Rosso. I wanted to start this event with a sh short video. At 18,000 revolutions per minute, this isn't music. This is the scream of science. This is the inner world of pneumatic valve springs, of mean effective pressure, 300 brake horsepower per liter of displacement, 
the quest for the perfect four-stroke V8 naturally aspirated reciprocating engine. And in the middle of the whole metal, the carbon, the alloy technology, sits flesh and blood. Rising out of its carbon fiber monocoque, the coolest head. These are the eyes that can pick out a face in the crowd, as if motion were being slowed down. Not passing in a blur of 200 miles per hour. This is the pure mathematics of angles and aerodynamics, the physics of g-forces and friction, and the raw instinct to race. These are the masters of speed. This is Formula One. This is a video that was released a few years ago by BBC, and it's called uh, The Scream of Science. And I think it's a wonderful metaphor of what Formula One is. It's a place where, as academics, we develop managerial lessons and managerial understanding that we then share to other industries. And this is precisely the purpose of this event, to try to understand what can we learn from an environment that is so cutting edge in terms of technology, managerial practice, and uh, what this what can be transferred to other worlds. Uh, Formula One per se is also an important industry for this country. Uh, employees in the motorsport industry around 50,000 people all around the world, around 30 countries involved. And uh, it's one of the few manufacturing industries that is still growing in a country that had the industrial revolution. So it's definitely interesting industry to look at. It's at the doorstep of CAS and City University because um, it's basically in the Oxford here. Majority of teams, even the ones that sound like Germans, like Mercedes, are actually located uh, around the corner from here. So uh, it's definitely important for a leading business school to look into this. And uh, tonight we can do it with a group of wonderful panelists. But uh, why Formula One at CAS? Well, let me tell you something about specifically why this event is taking place at CAS. We are most likely the, the business school with the highest number of academics who have published or are writing about Formula One in the business. It's, there are other people who study other subjects, but we have six academics that have been are, are working on this topic, or they have published in this. Um, and uh, the research that we started with the previous event two years ago has been said around 250 times in the, in the media, including by some of the distinguished panelists here. And uh, last, uh, it was for this reason uh, listed between the 10 research, scientific research with the highest impact in the media of any fields of science. And it was the only one from business and social sciences. In 2015, so last year, uh, one of the papers that was authored here in this, uh, in this school received the best paper, as, uh, best innovation paper published in a top journal uh, in the world. So uh, we got certain type of expertise and one interesting aspect of this is that we're trying to put it also um, available to the people that engage with us thanks to uh, our, the collaboration with Scuderia Toro Rosso of uh, which uh, represented here by Mr. Otello Valenti. Uh, well, we, you'll hear from him that basically we put all this knowledge into an executive education module, executive education program that is called Leading Fast and Turbulent Environments. It's gonna be launched in 2016. Uh, and it will go through some of the key topics uh, that have been uh, developed in research, like real-time big data decision-making high pressure conditions, coordination team building through a real Formula One pit stop. So actually the participant will do a pit stop with a Formula One car from Toro Rosso. Uh, we'll talk about leading innovation in a highly competitive environment and business modeling, some of the core topics that are developed in research and education here at CAS. For more information, there's gonna be a desk outside. So uh, two of our collaborators, Carlo and Samuel will be there and please leave your contacts if you wanna know more about this because we're about to launch this program. But let's go and talk about the, the six wonderful people that are, uh, are with us tonight. Uh, they don't need presentation because these are pretty much uh, public, uh, uh, public people, but um, I would like still to, to give you some information. Kevin Eason is the Formula One correspondent at the Times. He's been covering sport for uh, almost 20 years. He's been uh, named as the most powerful uh, journalist in the sport. Graham Loden, former CEO of Manor, 
uh, a person who actually helped to build and keep this team in the game, faced a extremely difficult condition and managed to keep the a small team in a game, which is almost as difficult as winning a world championship to a certain extent, and uh, long experience in motorsport with Manor Marussia. Pier Giorgio Grossi, former head of IT at Ferrari Formula One, uh, eight championship won during the times of uh, legendary times of Michael Schumacher. Uh, there's a lot of to talking about big data and decision making. He's the guy who actually designed the decision make syst making system at Ferrari. Uh, so um, he will be able to tell us more about this. Uh, Mark Jenkins, the leading scholar in Formula One, uh, academic scholar for business, he wrote more papers uh, himself than all the other scholars who work on this topic, which is me, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and is uh, about to launch the third edition of his uh, masterpiece, which is a lesson from, um, lesson from Formula One, uh, it's going to be released in June. Uh, the third edition. Joe Sword, uh, I'm just telling you this, uh, uh, one week ago, he posted something on his blog. He's a journalist with uh, 20 plus years of experience. He's not missed one Grand Prix since 1988. Uh, and uh, he posted something about the event. And on that day, we had 100 people signing up. So he's one of the clear opinion leaders in this industry. And he's also a visiting lecturer at Cranfield in motorsport. Uh, finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Otello Valenti. HR director at Ferrari Formula One during the Schumacher time. Uh, he's the guy who basically created in a year and a half uh, the uh, Maserati Motorsports team. And now he's the a uh, HR director and legal director at Toro Rosso, which is considered probably the talent development team um, of Formula One. Created several world champions, including Sebastian Vettel and uh, new upcoming genius, driving genius, uh, Verstappen. And uh, he can tell us a lot about what talent means and is why also we are partnering with Toro Rosso. So uh, this is it for me. Uh, maybe I talk too much, but what we do now is I'm gonna launch a discussion that is gonna be uh, done in the Formula One style, meaning each one of the panelists will have 3.5 minutes and not more than that to respond to my question. And the question is, watch, what can we learn from the, the business of Formula One, from the world of Formula One that can be useful to people who don't work in Formula One and they don't know what Formula One is, they maybe just watch NASCAR or IndyCar. There's still time for improvement. <laughs> no, now you're in Europe, we can. <laughs> so uh, 3.5 minutes, I would start uh, from the right coming uh, this way and, uh, and then we'll open the, the floor to discussion. Uh, so we'll discuss between us, and uh, at the end, you'll be able to ask some questions to our panelists, and we'll end up with some drinks, uh, and a f you know, hopefully a nice evening for all of us. Thank you very much. I was told that the Italian maybe can have some seconds more because they have to speak in a different language. 3.5 <laughs> 3. Italians minutes. It, yeah. Exactly. Flexible. Yeah. <laughs> Hotello, <laughs> all yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I have to thank uh, uh, CAS Business School and Paola Versa to have invited me to this very pleasant event. Uh, I try not to steal too much time, as usual, for uh, the Italian approach. But rather than telling you what you should learn from Formula One, I try to share with you shortly uh, my latest experience with Toro Rosso and tell you what I've learned. I think this is what probably can be more relevant. I joined uh, Scuderia Toro Rosso in 2010, and it was a pure racing team with more or less 180 staff, mainly based in Italy. Uh, the external perception of the team was that of a Red Bull satellite in Italy. Uh, in the previous years, the team scored eight points and finished on the 10th place in the Constructor Championship. And the key technical roles were filled mainly by senior Italian engineers with a lot of experience in motorsport but without fresh Formula One experience coming from the best performing teams. And at that time, the team was not able to attract talented engineers from the UK and from the best performing teams. 
Uh, after five years, last year, uh, the situation was a little bit different. Uh, Toro Rosso was considered and is considered an international team with more than 400 staff, 50% uh, Italian and 50% from the rest of the world, uh, based with 300 people in Italy and 100 people in the UK, uh, has scored the highest level of points in his history, 67 points, and has finished on the seventh place in the Constructor Championship. Uh, have won the award for the best uh, aerodynamic race car, uh, uh, an award that has been won in previous years by Red Bull and Mercedes, so cars that have won the World Championship. And we had probably the first, the, f the, the fourth uh, fastest chassis on the, on the racetrack. Uh, we have been able to recruit talented engineers uh, at all levels, from the UK, from Italy, from um, other countries in the world, and from big, high-performing team like Mercedes, like Ferrari, like McLaren. And the perception of the team moved from being a satellite of Red Bull in Italy uh, probably to be a fully-fledged Formula One constructor team. Uh, it has not been an easy work. It has been a very hard work because I can tell you that 2010-2011, uh, I've probably personally met more than 70 senior talented engineers trying to convince them to join Toro Rosso, and I've been able to convince only two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the first thing I've learned personally is that more of, the more of the same is not enough, is not what it was needed to us to, to try to make a difference and to develop the team. What, what in reality at the end of this uh, first part of a journey, because we are still uh, continuing to, to fight on, on, the, on the racetrack, is that our experience has shown that to be or try to be successful, we need a stable leadership team at the helm of a company, uh, a clear and communicated strategy, uh, for sure clear targets, clear roles, and clear performance expectations within the team, uh, to have the solution ready before the problem appears, uh, to take fast decision, and then to learn from results, from the good ones and from the bad ones, uh, for sure to avoid complacency, uh, we have never reached any target, so the target is always something to be, to be reached uh, the following day. Try to build a no-blame culture, so to be focused on the pro internal processes rather than on the person and the, possibly on the weaknesses of the person. And work to continuously look for and hire the best talent and make sure that they are team players. And as a last point, but very important point, try to keep a profile in the media. Um, I think Formula One, I'm going to go cut straight to the chase here. Um, Formula One can teach business a lot, uh, and it can learn a lot. Formula One is brilliant. It's a brilliant business. It's incredibly dysfunctional. Um, it does amazing things with speed of reaction. It energizes people enormously. And at the same time, it drives away fans and makes a mess of things. So we can learn how to run a business by working together, uh, and you can learn by looking at the individual teams and seeing how they do things. And the teams are really exceptional. Um, even the bad ones are exceptional. And it was interesting, Paolo was saying about Graham um, and keeping Manor alive. I think what Graham did with Manor, keeping it alive, was much more difficult than winning world championships with Mercedes Benz. <laughs> No, no, but it, you learn more. Kevin Magnuson said this to me yesterday in Paris. He said, you learn more when things go wrong than when things go right. And he's absolutely right. So a lot of the people who are in the top in Formula One are there because they failed before. The McLaren cars are called MP4. Do you know why? McLaren Project 4. What happened to Projects 1, 2, and 3? That's what happened. Ron Dennis failed three times, and he doesn't like failing. Frank Williams 
was known as Wanker Williams for 10 years. <laughs> that was his nickname. So you learn from your mistakes and you make it better. And you, and you hire, as you said, the best people. You do everything you can. And I think Formula One is utterly brilliant because it, it, it just gets everyone going. It's a passionate business. It gets people excited, interested, and it gets them to be efficient. It makes people work hard. And I think one of the things that I see when I look outside Formula One is massive inertia in every industry. You want something done, you say, we need it now, and it'll come next week. In Formula One, you say, we need it now, and it is there 15 minutes later. Thank you. Um, well, as I often do, I find myself agreeing um, with a lot of things that Joe's just said, and in particular, this, this idea of um, there are some lessons to be learned uh, from Formula One, and also Formula One uh, can learn an awful lot from, from business as well. I've always viewed Formula One as, or motorsport in general actually, as uh, the greatest team sport in the world. Um, if you think of some sports that are traditionally seen as team sports like soccer, or football, uh, or perhaps rugby, which used to kind of uh, cater for all shapes and sizes of players on the pitch, whereas now I think every rugby player is absolutely ginormous uh, athlete. If you look at a Formula One team, the team it's, these teams are so enormous, um, and, uh, and they cater for all shapes, all sizes, all genders, uh, all sorts of people, but all focused on, on one task, and it is, it is the greatest team sport in the world. Um, it's also an incredibly simple business. It's the simplest business I've ever come across. Uh, and my background was in engineering and uh, um, I had a, uh, a history of doing some tech startup businesses and they were incredibly complicated. Um, if you look at Formula One, the, it's highly regulated. Um, the rules are available for anyone, they're on the internet, you can download them, that's what the teams do, uh, and uh, even the entry forms on the internet. It's unbelievably simple, it tells you where to turn up, uh, and what you have to do, and what's legal and what's, and what's not legal. But in its simplicity lies the reason why it is so difficult, because unfortunately, or fortunately, um, there's a bunch of other people doing exactly the same as what you're doing when you're trying to run your team to exactly the same set of rules. And that's quite unusual in business. Most businesses don't have such a prescribed set of rules and regulations. So one of the first tech businesses that I co-founded, I remember we spent a year trying to work out who the customer was. I mean, we had absolutely no idea. We had some great tech, but we didn't know we didn't know who to sell it to. You like Formula One? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so Formula One is, 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 is really simple. And, and some people will say, what, is, what does a Formula One team do? And you would think the answer would be, well, they, they make some cars and they go around in circles and you try and go quicker than the next guy. And it's completely wrong. You know, modern Formula One team sells marketing and hospitality services for an incredibly high margin and it uses that money to create a unique selling point, which is operating, operating the team. And if you take your eye off generating the income, then there's either no business, if you're an independent team, or no reason to keep uh, uh, funding, if you like, if you are, for example, a car manufacturer, where it's not their primary business. A car manufacturer's primary business is to make cars. So it's... It's, an, it's a, an industry which has some very unique uh, attributes, primarily due to its simplicity and its difficulty. It's the, most, it's the most difficult business I've ever been involved with, full stop. Simplest but most difficult. And I think from a uh, management point of view, that, that brings into play some interesting areas because uh, typically in motorsport, in the, in the sharp end of motorsport, um, managers do make a difference. I'm sure you've all um, seen industries where people are in management roles and it really doesn't make any difference. You know, they're paid to just allow things to just happen. And uh, the, the motor racing environment doesn't allow for
for that um, for that situation. Managers are paid to make a difference, and uh, and so there are some interesting lessons to learn. Some of them have uh, some relevance in other industries, and some of them don't because it, it is a it is an industry with some uh, quite unique um, quite unique attributes. So that's my view on. That. Uh, yeah, so I, I've been fortunate enough to be looking at Formula One for 16 or 17 years now, uh, looking to see what made the team successful, but also looking to see what other organisations can learn. Uh, we've done over a, nearly 100 interviews now uh, on various stages of the research. We've been to lots of Formula One facilities. We had to go to some races to do valid research. It was really important. Uh, Mr Eccleston gave us passes and we're, we're very grateful for that. Um, so, so what's the, the one thing that comes out? Well, a number of things, of course, as Graham was saying, teamwork, incredible, innovation, technology, you know, the things that, that Joe mentioned. But the one thing that I, I'd, I'd pick on that, that was really, really stands out is the speed of learning. Formula One teams learn at an incredible rate. And if any organisational business could get close to that rate of learning, they'd be incredibly successful. I don't know if you've heard of the paradox of Theseus. Um, it, it's from the story of Theseus, and it's about a ship. And this ship had every component, every piece of wood of it, replaced uh, during its lifetime. And so the, the paradox is, is that still the same ship? I prefer a more contemporary version of this story, which is the story of Trigger's broom. Uh, if you've seen the, the series Only Fools and Horses, the road sweeper Trigger was given a medal by the council for having the same broom for 20 years and therefore saving the council money. Um, but it transpired that this broom had actually had 17 new heads and 14 new handles. So again, was it the same broom? <laughs> and a Formula One car is a bit like that. Uh, Pat Simmons was telling me that for the new FW38, they're going to issue 10,000 new part numbers um, to create that new car. From March through to November, when the car is being raced, they will issue another 10,000 new part numbers because that car is going to be continually developed and improved. And, and that is because, there, so therefore, the car that ends in Abu Dhabi will be a totally different car than the one that started in Melbourne in March. Williams estimate that a new component goes on their car every 20 minutes. McLaren estimate a new component goes on every 17 minutes. Although that might be due to the fact they're not doing so well at the moment, so they might have to <laughs> speed it up a little bit. Um, so, so how are they able to do this? Well, well one of the things that, that came out really strongly to us is the, they review. They take every opportunity to learn, to use data, to use insight, opinion, and to improve. A Grand Prix re weekend has five instances where the car goes on a track. Three free practices, a qualifying session, and a Grand Prix. After every one of those events, there will be a review. Perhaps only 15 or 20 minutes, but in the case of Mercedes, that review could mean 60 or 70 individuals all connected together through headsets for the review. Around 30 of them at the track, another 40 or so back at their head office at Brackley. Now, they don't review for the sake of it, they review to make things better. And actually, after the race, they will spend over two hours often reviewing. That's longer than the actual race. Because they know if they don't, they won't stand a chance of winning the next race. So there's this incredible focus on constant reviewing. And how do they do that? They do it through the management, they do it through the culture and the focus and all those things that, that have already been mentioned. Thank you. We live in a pretty complex uh, age and business, and, and this complexity comes from things that uh, have a lot to do with, with Formula One in some way. The first one is velocity. I mean, everything goes extremely fast today. We move fast. I was in, in Italy f four hours ago, probably. Uh, I will be in Italy tomorrow morning at six. Um, goods move fast in our business and especially data moves fast inside our organization, outside our organizations, and, and crossing the boundaries of our organization. 
The second element is uh, variety. I mean, our grandparents used to live in the same place for the entire life, probably, and doing probably the same uh, job, uh, talking with the same people. Uh, we are doing exactly the opposite. We are looking for new things with diverse stuff. Uh, I'm here, I'm an Italian, talking in London about Formula One and business. So it is an example. The third, the third element is, is volume. I mean, this speed and this variety is coming in high, high, high volume. I mean, everything is really fast and, and very diverse. Now, there is a, a small thing that helps us in, in navigating into this sea of complexity. And it's our uh, ability to make decisions. We make every day tens, hundreds, probably thousands of decisions. Some are very fast, some, some are slow, some are easy, some are difficult, and we never know which one will make the difference. I was lucky enough to live in this kind of time machine that's Formula One. Uh, as an IT guy, uh, I was able to see the future when in 2000 and 2005 I was doing what Paul was, was saying, uh, building the application of, of Ferrari at that time. And um, what I saw is what's happening now that's called data revolution. We are flooded by data in our organization, in our life. I don't know you, but I have, for example, this stuff here that's taking telemetry of me continuously, same how I sleep, how I walk. And um, this, um, this new uh, ability, capability that we have in, in looking at data uh, can drive us from the era of oracles where people were looking at birds flying and, and making decisions just with instinct to a, a new, a new uh, era, uh, that's the era of what's called, for example, the data scientist. I mean, persons that have, first of all, a deep understanding of data. Uh, decisions uh, have to be based on data. And Formula One is, uh, is teaching us since, uh, I don't know, 1995, probably or even before. But it's not just about data, because uh, between good data and a good decision, there is a non-neutral uh, elements that the decision maker, the person. So uh, this data has to be analyzed by person, and so the focus of this data scientist is also to understand how this data, when this data uh, are uh, seen and analyzed by people. If you think, for example, of, of a race strategy, uh, I mean, the, the input of a race strategy is pretty easy of, of an application. It's timing. Uh, well, it's different if you think of the day before the race, when someone looks at this data, he has time, he can wait. Uh, it's in a context where he has time to make analysis. But what happens when there is, during the race, maybe an accident or something, and the car is, is next to the uh, pit entry, and someone has two or three seconds to make a decision. So the context is completely sorry, uh, different. And so uh, this data scientist, for example, has to uh, know a lot about how, how, how our brain works. That's all. <laughs> Four minutes. Three and a half Italian minutes. There's not much left when you're last, is there? <laughs> um, well, hello and very nice to see you. I guess the pubs must shut early around here, do they? <laughs> they have nowhere else to go. Uh, look, let me disabuse you of the notion that I'm, I'm powerful. Um, my <laughs> wife says I'm not even powerful in my own house, so that's the end of that. I'm certainly not a, a business expert. Um, in fact, I was reminded of that last week because uh, two years ago I spent five days in the High Court watching Bernie Eccleston give evidence in a, a case which was a £100 million compensation claim brought by a German media company um, over the sale of Formula One. And Bernie, bless his cotton socks, was, he did his best for five days, but on the final afternoon, the, uh, the QC acting for the German company, um, a guy called Philip Marshall, I don't know whether anybody's come across him, he's known as the star of the bar, a frightfully, amazingly clever guy. But he introduced a line of questioning about an intercompany loan that clearly only he understood. <laughs> and there was a group of three, three journalists there, and I was one of them. And we listened to this and we sort of nodded sagely and then left 
A week later, we were at the American Grand Prix, and I was sitting in the media centre typing. I got a tap on the shoulder. It was Bernie. And he looked down at me. He said, um, do you enjoy the, the court case? I said, it was great fun. Great, great laugh. Thanks very much. He said, that Friday afternoon, he said, I looked down at you lot, and I thought, they haven't got a clue what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> You're dead right there, Bernie. He said, but to be fair, I had no idea either. <laughs> So we're not all experts, um, but I, I suppose my position is that over um, a period of about two decades, I've had the opportunity to sort of pull the curtain back and look backstage at what happens in, in Formula One. And of course what I see is a schizophrenic sport, I, I, those of you who follow it will, will realise it is completely bipolar, you've got the, the sort of ruling body headed by Bernie, which uh, is just too bizarre for words on occasion, and it must be the only business that, you know, for every £10 it makes, it decides to give nearly four to some private equity group who don't do anything. They don't invest it, they don't help the sport, so they don't organise anything. Um, so that's clearly a, a very weird way to organise. I suggest you don't do that. It's not a good idea. <laughs> but then, as guys have, have been saying at the other end, you've got teams, incredibly committed people. Uh, some of the best brains on the planet. I, I always say, if you want to sell, solve uh, greenhouse emissions, just call in one of the Formula One teams. I'll have it done in a fortnight. Absolutely no problem. You want to get to Mars? That might take three weeks, but they'll, they'll crack it. Not a problem. But the one thing that Formula One has that probably very few other businesses have, unlike perhaps like Graham's technology company, you didn't know who to sell to, it has a great philosophical conundrum uh, to solve because it doesn't know whether it wants to be an entertainment, a sport, or a business, or a combination of all three. And that is where we are at the moment. There's a certain amount of turmoil in, in the business because nobody really knows how it's all going to work. But what I would say is that there is a well of extraordinary knowledge in these teams. And I'm so pleased to see people like Frank Williams <laughs> Uh, and Ron Dennis at McLaren, who are now opening up the business to other avenues. So you will find McLaren technology in hospitals and airports. Uh, There's a lovely story the other day of a, a three-year-old boy in a hospital in Birmingham who is wired. He has a, a serious heart problem, and it stops, and the doctors have to get to him immediately to restart his heart. He's now wired with McLaren sensors, just as Jensen Button would be, so that the instant his heart stops, the bell goes off and he can be dealt with. I'd like to see a lot more of that from Formula One. That's a great demonstration of how speed of thought can be turned into something very useful. So I, I guess we are now at the point in which we, we open the floor. So one of the questions that I think probably we have, many of us have in mind is, Formula One is losing traction uh, as a sport. Uh, last year we saw a lot of empty seats at the races. Uh, every year there is a team that struggles to be in the game, uh, eventually falls from the game. It seems there is something flawed in the system and to a certain extent uh, Formula One is a great digestive moment after Sunday lunch because a lot of people after the, the start usually sleep, me included. So. How, is there something to fix here? And if yes, what? And is it possible or is it un un unlikely? Is this something that is going to hap happen after, the, after Bernie, if there is an after Bernie? Uh, <laughs> nobody knows. Or uh, what, it's, what should we fix? And uh, launch it to the floor, whoever wants to pick it up. Well, just to let you know that I've got a £10 bet with Bernie that I go before he does. <laughs> He's got considerably more years on the, on the clock than I have. Uh, well, I bring it back to this philosophical conundrum that the sport's not really sure which direction it wants to go in, and it's, it's got itself all sort of knotted about where it is, and it operates on a 40-year-old on a business model, so you, you basically milk the circuits, you milk the TV companies, you milk the sponsors. You don't then give anything back. But of course, when you've had your Sunday lunch, there's a fair chance you'll be mowing the lawn. You might want to go to a wine bar with your wife. You might you know, have something to do on a computer. So you, the, the TV is no longer the fixed point any, any longer. And Formula One hasn't grasped that, mainly because Bernie 
actually could only watch his TV. Although I will tell you that 20 years ago when they started the digital channel, he called me into his bus in Monaco and he said, um, he said have you seen this digital channel? Absolutely marvellous. I said, well, let's have a look. I haven't seen it. I'm always at the races. He said, it's great. Look at this. And he got the gun. And he went like that. And I said, that's MTV, Bernie. He said, yes, I know, I know, I know. That's BBC One. Yes, I know. I know it is. After about ten minutes of this, he picked the gun up. He threw it across the <laughs> well, I'm telling you, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that dynamic has to change. And I think you see in NASCAR um, and, and other sports, we've engaged with YouTube, Google, all this sort of stuff. Formula One needs to get onto that quick. Mm. Joe? I think that there's a couple of points. I, I think that Kevin made a very good point about giving all the money to uh, private equity. It's the dumbest situation. We understand why, we understand how, but we also understand it has to stop. Um, the problem is how do you make it stop? And so that's something that needs to be solved. We need to reinvest the money that's being made and also make more money because I don't think there's anything like the money being made that could be made because they don't need to. They don't care that much about investing because it's so easy to just take the money out all the time. My other point, which I think is very key, is who is our audience? Who is the audience? Bernie, in a famous interview, talking about people can't buy Rolexes, I'm not interested in unless they can. So the audience, according to Bernie, is the 45, 50-year-old man. I would argue that the audience for Formula One should be 30-something-year-old women. Now, you may think, what is all that about? The answer is very simple. Who decides on leisure spending? <laughs> be honest. Be honest. Who decides what you do with the kids? Now, if you have noisy cars um, and nothing at all apart from mud, bad television, sorry, bad uh, toilets, bad food, mud, traffic jams, who's going to take the kids to that? If you have spoiled brats who won't sign autographs, who's going to take the kids to that? So you need role models and you need the mothers to say, this is a good thing for my kids to see. And if we do that, we get a young audience and guess what? The sport lives for another 30, 40, 50 years beyond that. And it's possible because people say kids don't like cars. Walt Disney Corporation movie cars. Has anyone got any idea how much money that franchise has made in the 10 years it's been in operation? 12 billion. That's 1 billion in films and 11 billion in merchandising and not one penny of that has gone to Formula One. Despite the fact there is a red racing car that appears in the second film. Yeah. So who's doing it wrong? seem like yeah, you have something to say about this. Well, I think what, one comment I would make is it's, it's very easy to blame Bernie. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he will watch this. Somebody no, no, no. Of, of his men will yeah, watch yeah. this yeah. video probably. But I, well, I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've constantly been one of the people who, who doesn't blame Bernie because I don't think Bernie's the problem. I think uh, um, he's a very clever guy. He's also a guy who's making a lot of money out of Formula One, and uh, that's not his fault. You know, he's making a lot of money out of Formula One um, because that's what he's employed to do. He's the CEO of the company that owns the commercial rights to Formula One, and uh, there is a there's, a there's a structural issue there, and both Kevin and uh, and Joe have, have picked up on that structural issue. It, it, there's, there's a huge amount of revenue leakage out of out of the industry. Um, because of a particular structure, but it's not, that's not Bernie's fault. And he, he operates within a, within a structure. It's his job uh, as the CEO of a company to do the best possible job that he can for that company. And if you had shares in his company, you would be absolutely delighted with his performance. You would think he's tremendous. <coughs> And the, the only thing I'd say is, who created the structure? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but that you know that's history, and you know, and that that's been and gone. Who allowed him to create the structure? And probably more to the point, who stood back and and uh, and, and and you know and didn't intervene in, in any particular way. So we have a structure at present. It's a one where um, the commercial rights holder is having a, a tremendous return 
there was no incentive for them to, uh, you know, the reason why a lot of these things that Kevin's quite rightly pointed out, the reason why a lot of this technology is not being embraced or, or whatever else is there is very little incentive to change the risk profile of, of their investment. And the unfortunate thing for that is if you're not a shareholder of the company that's doing tremendously well, then it's not a good place to be. And of course, the biggest asset that Formula One has is, is its fan base, because without that, you can't build any business at all. And uh, Formula One enjoys an enormous fan base across the world. It's, in, it's incredibly diverse, very well educated, thanks largely to uh, the, the, the media, and the media attention on Formula One is, is, is intense. Um, and uh, and you, would, you would hope that that asset, which is the most important asset that any industry built, uh, um, uh, as, as Formula One is, on um, uh, media rights in, in particular, um, you would hope that that fan base would be growing not just in size, but also in uh, enjoyment, um, in their love for the sport and the passion for the sport. And I think all, all of the people on the panel have talked about um, how passionate um, the fans can be. And so he, he, you know, here's, here's the problem. Here's, there's, there's a structural issue. We know from other industries that growth is possible. And you look at, you know, Joe pointed out, a film has made more money than all the Formula One teams put together for the last probably 20 or 30 years or something like that. Um, there's a, so we know that um, there are models that do allow for um, for growth and stability, and those are the two th the two things that are missing from the model that we currently have are growth. <coughs> Formula One is is you know for all the numbers when you look at them are impressive. The most impressive numbers are really the technical techni mm -hmm. technological ones. The 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 growth <coughs> figures are non-existent and. Uh, you know, in, in business, growth is important and profit is important. You know, the um, uh, turnover is vanity and profit sanity saying. You know, it's an old saying, but it's, it's, it's a very true one. And that leads to um, uh, the fact that there can be instability. So if we look at some other um, sports that have experienced incredible amount of growth, um, they can still have, you know, one of the things that people often point out is, is that Formula One um, uh, suffers from the fact that um, uh, the winners win everything and the losers um, always lose. And that's true. Um, but there are some other sports which have successfully embraced that. And uh, soccer is an interesting one. Soccer's always had winners and losers. It's always been Manchester United. And, you know, I'm a Newcastle United fan, so, <laughs> I, you know, I, which I've always said was the biggest prerequisite of entering Formula One, because if you can be a Newcastle fan, you can put up with pretty much anything. <laughs> um, but other, other models have, have embraced the diversity angle, um, so there are obviously other things to do with the structure um, that could be improved, and the signs of improvement would be um, more stability, uh, but growth. It's the single thing to me that's that's missing. And if we have growth, it inherently means improved enjoyment, and ultimately that's what we want that's, to see. It's a very interesting point because, um, <coughs> to a certain extent, uh, there is more interest in motorsport in general. And motorsport companies, uh, Mark, I don't know what you think. How are motors beside Formula One? How are motorsport companies doing in general? Like, how's the industry going? I think it's variable, actually, would be mm. fair to say. I mean, I think it, it's a very strong industry mm. in the UK. Uh, I think the supply chain gets squeezed, you know, during the current period when the Formula One teams are doing a lot of composite work and mm -hmm. the supply chain is needed. So I, I, th I think, you know, there are some parts that are doing very well, there are other parts that are struggling. But in general, the motorsport industry is worth about £8 billion a year, which is a bit less than the cars. Uh, uh, thing that Joe was just talking about, but it's actually bigger than the marine industry in the UK, which people don't realise. So, so that yeah, there's, there's an issue about Formula One, but there's also an issue, issue about motorsport more, more generally. Right. right. Well, I think one of the interesting bits when I look at Formula One teams is that um, 
there are some business models, new business models are coming through, and I, I, I try to study a little bit about this with some of my colleagues here at CAS. And uh, one interesting business model that I saw is what, for example, Toro Rosso is doing. So the idea of giving the opportunity to a young guy to you know, uh, have his, his own career without necessarily bringing sponsors or money uh, and, and ultimately even accessing to a major, um, a, a major team like Red Bull. And uh, on the other hand, there are, uh, like Marchione said recently, we, we're thinking of going this business too by you know, opening up to re bring, bringing back Alfa Romeo to, to Formula One and creating another satellite team or a team that somehow is connected. Uh, Otello, what, what is your experience from, you know, how did Red Bull come up with this model of you know, getting two teams and uh, one for the juniors and then like a school for drivers? Uh, and what are the benefits that you got from it? Yeah, I think there were two um, things connected, an opportunity and a strategy and a vision. Uh, the vision was a business vision and is a business vision because I, I agree with most of the things that have been said by Graham, by Kevin and Joe. That there's a business side that is very important in the industry in Formula One and, and there is a technology side and probably currently technology and business are not going in the same direction or a little bit in conflict. Uh, the, uh, an important thing that not many people consider is that uh, Toro Rosso and Red Bull Racing for Red Bull Company are marketing projects, are not Formula One teams simply, are seen as marketing projects. We are into the big budget of the company as marketing tools are advertising on newspapers, are different kind of project. So the concept behind the idea of investing in two Formula One teams in a young driver program was to have tools able to uh, improve the knowledge of the brand, the awareness of the company, and to reach the target, the customer that more were close to the product that Red Bull wanted to spread into the different kind of markets. And Formula One, from this perspective, was and is still a very powerful commercial tool because it has probably the biggest audience in the sport industry, can reach all the most relevant markets during the year, 21 races this year, uh, has the ability to cover the full year. The season starts in February with the test and end in November, but there is buzz on the press and in the TV in, in December and January as well for the new cars to be prepared. There's the driver's market and, and so on. So uh, the, the fact that uh, there can be a very powerful tool from the business perspective has pushed Red Bull to go into this direction. But that's, part, that's part, part of the, sorry, I was going to say that's part of the philosophical conundrum I was talking about because Red Bull and Toro Rosso exist as a marketing tool, and if the numbers don't crunch in the right way, then Mr. Matichitz will probably say, well, it's not worth doing that anymore, so we'll, we'll pull out. But Manchester United will always be Manchester United. In the NFL, the American football, you know, there are franchise movements, but there will always be the San Francisco 49ers, there will always be the Chicago Bears. They, they exist beyond this this essential need for branding. When Renault launched yesterday, I'll bet that 90% of the chatter was about branding and about market outreach and reaching new markets for Renault. It was very little about, well, we really want to be world champions. And again, you know, Renault, back end of last year, could easily pull out of Formula One because they didn't think they were getting bang for their, their marketing buck. And this is the problem. So you think we could we could have a Formula One with a Ferrari? I wanted to ask uh, to Pierre uh, George <laughs> since, since he's been. Uh... <laughs> no, I, I will be writing this down. <laughs> no, no. Can I'll Formula be... One exist yeah. without some of the yeah. iconic teams? Can we have a Formula One without Ferrari? Well, it's. it's I don't know how to say what to say. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say anything. We are recorded. <laughs> uh, but two, two things uh, pop up in my mind uh, talking about this uh, topic. Uh, of course, IT stuff, as I'm the IT guy. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think of my son. 
I don't know if you are, if you have children, but my son, it's 11, it watches TV with something in his hands. Okay, it's my son, so I have two, so probably he has some. But uh, so um, Formula One and can be boring sometimes. Uh, but they have something in their hands, and so we might try to engage uh, in a different way during, during the, the race, if they are not there, or even if they are there. Second topic that is related is that everything about Formula One is under a license, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but if you think of new models like uh, recently uh, Uber, uh, they open their API, so that the way in which you can uh, interact uh, f from a program with, with their um, systems, and you can use uh, the Uber uh, fleet to, uh, as a logistic company. So you can create business, new business, that uh, uses their business to create something new. And it's, that's because uh, it's an open model, or in a way they open something to the uh, external, and so you can uh, attach your ideas and your business to, uh, yeah, to Uber business. So what if uh, Formula One could open data or, or something like that to everyone? I think that's an interesting point that, that ties in with something Kevin said. I think where there's a lot of failure going on in terms of communication. I mean, how many people here know what the new engines in Formula One have actually achieved? It's, it's astonishing. For over 100 years, engineers have been trying to make engines <coughs> that had a thermal efficiency that was better and better and better. They got to about 35%. And in two years, Formula One has taken it nearly to 50. And that's absolutely indisputable. And they haven't told anybody about it. It's extraordinary, because that is saving the world, if that's what we're here to do. That's saving the world. That means you, you go a lot further for the same amount of petrol. It's very simple. And if you apply that to the world at large, that technology, it's astonishing what could be done. And we're not doing any of that. So why? The, the people, Renault, they're, they're in it. They're in it for marketing. They're in it to, to get the technology. And they're not saying anything about these amazing engines. OK, Mercedes is better than theirs. But nonetheless, even Mercedes doesn't say much. Well, I think it's, it's kind of funny that there are a lot of people, former Formula One people, that bring technologies, knowledge to the world. I think of, for example, Better Decision, the company founded by Pierre Giorgio, that uses big data um, outside of Formula One. And it clearly brings a Formula One built expertise, but it's not uh, when you were up for, it's not Ferrari doing it, it's you in your own initiative coming out, right? Yeah. So some of the projects, for example, you're working on now, uh, of what you can say, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, today, as I, as I said before, uh, there is a lot of data. I mean, we know from Formula One uh, that you can do a lot with this. You can get today data easily from uh, things that's uh, what's tel um, it's called telemetry in Formula One. Uh, now it's easy. Uh, and for example, we have a lot of data from this stuff here that everyone has in his pocket. So your, uh, your smartphone knows that you are here, that uh, the path that you did coming here, where you're going to for lunch. And in fact, this application are starting talking to you and, and anticipating in some way. So uh, maybe they are saying, mm, it's, uh, 10 uh, minutes if you start now to go home or something like that. Or tomorrow there is uh, Genoa Juventus uh, football match in Italy. <laughs> because in some way they know, someone knows that I, I'm for, from, for Genoa. Um, <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, so uh, these new data uh, are able to give a lot of information. But more than data, uh, that's another thing that uh, I get, got from um, Formula One, uh, it's algorithm. So this mindset of analyzing and, and simulating and continuously uh, tuning this stuff to, um, to be sure that they are next to real life. In, in Formula One, talking about the wind tunnel, for example, or aerodynamics in general, there is the real life, the car, there is the simulation that's running big clusters, and there is the wind tunnel. One of the job is to have these three stuff synced because of course you can rely on just one if you, if you need, because maybe you cannot test. 
um, so this uh, focus on algorithm uh, predictions and so on it's something that it's very powerful today in business mm -hmm. mark your uh, you've been studying for example the the wave of technology in Formula One and somehow the waves corresponded also to changes in regulation sometimes. And I know you've been writing and giving your opinion about this. So are you, do you think that regulation are driving innovation in Formula One or they're reducing innovation? Because there is a lot of debate on this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting one because many organizations would see regulation as oppressive and get some running around like rabbits in the headlight. In a lot of situations, regulation F1 is seen as a new challenge, and everyone's given the same rules, and it's how well can you, and it was Andy Cowell from Mercedes said, you want to know how well have you answered the exam question, and that's on day one. Mm -hmm. You know how well you've interpreted the new rules, and have you really made it happen? So regulation is an opportunity, um, and that is a very different mindset than you see in many organizations, I was with a financial services company the other week, and they, they just sort of sat, sat there and said, well, we can't do anything because of the regulator, you know. They're not thinking about the opportunities they could create, whereas in Formula One, we do get that, that mindset mm -hmm. So should we release regulation and leave it open to the, or should we increase regulation? Joe, I know you could talk for hours on this, but <laughs> give us your opinion. You can't release it, because if you release it, you have to, have, with modern safety, health and safety rules, the spectators would have to sit about a mile and a half away from the car. <laughs> because if they had an accident, they, they would be just destroyed. It, it's, it's not possible. You can have ground effect. You can have all these things. But, but it, it's kind of a weird industry because f for the first 50 years, everyone was trying to make everything go faster. And then it got to a point where it couldn't go faster. It could go faster, but it was just not workable anymore. So since then, we've been going backwards and trying to slow everything down. And it, it's a bizarre set of circumstances, but what we have now is using technology in a, in a positive way for the sport. There's an argument about wind tunnels, for example, uh, that's been put forward that wind tunnels should be banned. Because what value is Formula One aerodynamics to anyone other than the Formula One aerodynamicist? The answer is not at all. It has no value because the cars are already sorted, road cars. Now, if they, if they banned the wind tunnel and used only computational fluid dynamics, that would improve that technology. And that technology could be applied to 100 different industries. And then all the Formula One teams could make loads of money selling their algorithms, strategies, data, you name it, to different industries. So I think the clever thing to do is to take, accept the fact you can't just keep pushing for the ultimate speed but find a way to get technology that is relevant to the world. Mm -hmm. And when it's relevant to the world and you have a good show, then it's, it's a slam dunk. I mean, you know, that's what everybody wants. It's a bit of everything for everybody. And then you just print money after that. <laughs> <laughs> there is um, an interesting regulation that has been uh, discussed uh, these days, and uh, uh, Kevin has been covering it in the Times, about the what they call the halo, so uh, kind of protection for the head of the driver. Now, uh, I'd like to ask Kevin to explain us what, 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 what's going on, and then I'd like to have an opinion on Graham, because we know this is a, something that probably is very dear to you, because unfortunately, after 21 years, am I right? Last year, we, we lost a driver, and it was uh, Jules Bianchi. Uh, uh, it was an official driver for the team that Graham was actually running. And uh, it's an extremely sad moment. Um, we, one could say that you know, for, for cars that go at 100 miles per hour, one person every 21 years is a good statistic, but still, we could have avoided that. So um, I, first of all, I'd like to see what's going on, and then ask Graham, do you think this is the solution, or uh, is there anything else we should do about this? Yeah, they, they, for those who don't know, of course, the, the whole idea of Formula One is it's got open wheels and open cockpits. <coughs> Um, but we've we've had this. See, in, in fact, it, it's one thing to say we've had two deaths. Actually, we've had four in in that twenty years because uh, Henry Surtees was killed at Brands Hatch at the age of eighteen hit by a flying wheel, and Justin Wilson, who some people might know here, another British guy, was killed in America in the IndyCar series last August, a month after um, Jules was uh, sadly after his funeral. Um, 
after Ayrton Senna was killed in 94, safety was transformed in, in Formula One, um, which is why we've had this amazing record. But the one bit that nobody solved was this bit here, and we've had actually quite a few near misses, uh, cars being launched and almost hitting the heads of drivers. So they've come up with this idea to have a, as Paulus says, the, the halo, which is a sort of structure which sits above the cockpit um, and has a very strange sort of strut right in front of the driver. I'm not quite sure how they're going to get around that because presumably we'll be doing that to <laughs> look around it. But the idea is that that will then stop uh, de bouncing debris or whatever it happens to be coming into the driver. I'm not entirely convinced about it myself yet, but growing quite a better yeah, I think, view. Yeah, I think, you know, if we look at the whole topic of rules and regulations, um, because this sits at part of it, um, then Formula One teams are extremely good at problem solving, we've, we've talked a bit about that already, and, and therefore the rules and regulations are extremely important because that's what unleashes the beast, if you like, on, on the problem, and the beast is, is the, uh, you know, the brain power of these teams, very well managed, very well focused, they have um, tools which are incredibly efficient and effective, so if you want if you want a problem solved, the Formula One team is a pretty good place to go. And therefore, forming the regulation is extremely important. And um, there's two areas, I think, where that has um, extreme importance. One is in safety. And, you know, clearly one, one death is too many, let alone two, three, or four. Um, uh, and so the formulation of the regulations um, for safety is, is, is something that's very important and it's something that Formula One is actually very good at I think and, and most sport in general is, is, is actually very good at and it should keep going and it should keep trying to solve those problems. With regard to the specific um, uh, head restraint, uh, sorry the intrusion protection um, regulations, I don't know enough about the meetings that are taking place on the, on, the, on the specifics to say if that's going in the right direction. But one thing I would highlight in terms of, of the rules is, I think, as I, as I mentioned, the rules are important because if you set the rules correctly, the right solutions will be solved, but only if the right questions and the right scenarios are posed in, in, in the first place. And Formula One is not that good, I think, um, at having a blueprint for um, for that whole set of rules, it, apart from say, I think I think it does a very good job in, in the area of safety, and it's an area that um, teams take extremely seriously, quite rightly. But in other areas, and a good example is um, is the engines, is your power units. Sorry, <laughs> um, uh, as Joe said, from a technological point of view, they have. Um, Engineers have solved some unbelievable problems to create those power units, and uh, you know last year we were doing Grand Prix um, that were the same length as previous previous seasons, um, with with a normally aspirated V8 engine. You know the Grand Prix were the same length, but we used to use I don't know 160, 170 odd kilos of fuel, and now with these power units ex doing exactly the same race, using 100 kilos. Um, the fuel and that's limited in the in the regulations. So, unbelievable progress in the same time as well. Yeah, in, in yeah same same sort of lap times and incredible, but pointless because uh, you know as a as a guy running a team, um, we didn't have a single person offering our team any more money as sponsors or anything because of this. And there's only two teams now, three um, on the grid actually make engines. There's no championship for the engine. There's two championships, driver's championship and a constructor's championship. And and therefore the way the regulation change was nested in the overall um, structure of Formula One, if you like, here we had uh, almost like a regulation kind of out on its own. The technical regulation, you know, the, the guys got to work on it and they produced these fantastic things which a typical Formula One team can't actually shout about because we don't actually make them, we buy them. Um, a fan's interaction, uh, if they're sat at the racetrack, is probably 
linked more to the noise than anything else. And um, the very fact that people were talking about the noise being significantly different, and most people I spoke to certainly found that it was less impressive. You could certainly get di different texture from um, uh, from it, but it, but it removed something really quite um, basic and powerful about um, about Formula One. So here we had this regulation, the side effect of which was incredible steps forward in technological um, change. But for a team, most of them, um, unless you made engines or um, had the ability to actually utilize the marketing from it, which Mercedes obviously did, they renamed their car hybrid. I think they're the only ones who, um, who did. And uh, I remember at one meeting that we had, um, I, I even, partly for fun really, I even suggested that there should be a success tax um, imposed, <laughs> on the, um, imposed on the engine supplier. Um, because they're not a team, they're not a Formula One team, remember. And Re Renault have become one, but they were, there's an instance where you have a, um, an external supplier having an enormously massive influence on what the teams can do. And I never thought I would say I felt sorry for Red Bull, but I, I did when you, when you saw the problems that they had um, with the power unit because they don't make the power unit. Also Toro Rosso, I would Toro say. Rosso, yeah. and, um, and so, kind of the important, I know I've strayed off topic a bit here, but, but one of the reasons for mentioning it is, is Joe's observations on the regulations are absolutely right. And if there is a blueprint that provided a framework so that these regulations were set correctly, both in terms of technology and safety, then the solutions will be will be fantastic. But if there's some kind of alignment with the solutions so that the teams um, can benefit, then you know, then I think the system is, is, is much better. And I think you know, we look at on the safety side some of the research that's done within Formula One, but also the, F the FIA um, obviously have a, a, a remit much wider than Formula One. And um, it, it's extremely good to see that uh, um, that, that work is, is taken so seriously because when something, when something does happen in any, in any industry, in, in motor racing the highs are, are high and, and, and the lows are desperate, really desperate. And you know, and I've experienced both. And um, to know that there is that focus on trying to come up with safety solutions is is something that um, I think should be uh, uh, recognised and, and, and promoted. And hope you know these bright brains, if they can solve things, it's, yeah. it's, it's brilliant. Well, I think it's time to go to the floor and ask for some questions. We have uh, some help from. Uh, Kathleen and Ming with a microphone. So if somebody has some questions, don't be shy. There is, uh, we, can, we can start here and then. Thank you. If you want a question um, asked, always wear yellow. OK, you, you can decide whether to address the one or uh, throw it to the floor and somebody picks it up. Well, I, I think probably to Otello, but um, others may have a, a view. Um, the levels of innovation in Formula One are astonishing. The, the season is very long, in fact, probably non-stop for development. How do you manage a, a large team of people to sustain, at a, a human, at a personal level, how do you sustain that level of innovation? <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's a good question. I, I mean, if we should sustain uh, this with active, uh, action, we, we should not be able to do that. I think that the passion of the people involved in Formula One is the real energy that is a self-sustaining process. So I, I'm not requested to go after each one of my colleagues in the team and ask him to invest energy and time and uh, days and work to, to think to something, something new. From the management perspective, the difficult thing is exactly the opposite. I could, I, I, how can I could, from time to time, restrain the flow of ideas of my colleagues because they are not sustainable from the financial point of view? Are you talking about we, the engineers? We, we have, we have <laughs> no, no, not only engineers, <laughs> mechanics, all the people into the team have new ideas. And each and every day, there's something new that 
could become a project. We have not, not enough money to pay for the project. So the point is how we can try to take the best out of these ideas, but th there's no problem in trying to, uh, how can I say, give fuel to, to the innovation process. It's a self-promoting uh, and, and evolving process at the end of the day. Yep. Could I, could I, I just wanted to add something yeah, to that. Yeah, sure, please. Which is one of the counterintuitive things that came out of our research. I, I talked to a guy called Gordon Murray, who was technical director of McLaren in the year when they won 15 out of 16 Grand Prix. And he said, you can't believe how hard it was to keep people motivated. Because, you know, if we weren't first and second on the grid, it was a disaster. And a similar thing from Ross Braun during the Ferrari years was, we've got people in our organisation who don't know what it's like not to win the world championship. So how do you sort of keep them going because you know those lows are going to come and it's how you pick people up through those, which is the other challenge, I think. Well, both myself and Otello before joining Ferrari had uh, airs long like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's another reason. <laughs> okay. I think it's a kind of stress we also have in academia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think there's a question here and then up there. First thing. Uh, hi, thanks. I actually have a question. Uh, after what Mr. Grossi said about uh, the element between the data and the decision, so the decision maker. Um, do you see a future where this element, instead of being human, will be an artificial intelligence, which you know, will be able to call the car in for a pit in a quarter of a lap instead of a, a full lap because it understands that the tires are not performing that way? And linked to this, do you see, as it, it is happening in the automotive industry, um, giant like tech technology, tech companies such as Google, uh, being able to enter in that one and compete uh, with all the other teams? <coughs> okay. Uh, well, technically, probably <coughs> in some years there will be the possibility to write a piece of software that can be quite intelligent and, and call the car in and so on. I don't know if it is what we want uh, because it's a sport uh, and so um, I don't know. What I, have, what I see is that some of the regulations are going to the direction of, uh, I mean, having less resources on the software side no matter if it's CPU for the, win, for the CFD or it is uh, electronic on board of the car. So from one side, we see the market that doing the autonomous driving car. And from the other side, in Formula One, we have the same electronic for every team since I don't remember when. So maybe that is one of the areas in which that might be uh, different rules because, I mean, Software-driven innovation is pretty strong everywhere, and it's a pity uh, thinking that Formula One that was ahead uh, probably 10 years ago now is a little bit behind. Just for information, there is a championship for driverless cars mm. next year in yeah. Formula, Formula E, so that should be quite entertaining. That would save Mercedes a few quid, wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 a million a year. Yes, yeah. Yeah. A bit more, yeah. yeah. Real question up there. Yeah, uh, bienvenue to uh, City Alumnus. Um, I started watching Formula One around 2007, thereabouts. And I remember yeah, people would say to me, people around me would say to me, in a kind of critical way, saying, um, well, you're only watching it because of Lewis Hamilton. And I thought it was very perceptive on their part, because that's precisely why I started watching it. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, you know, I'm not alone. I mean, I got a lot of entertainment out of it and a lot of insights from, from the sport. And I'm not alone. I think um, uh, Lewis's entry into the sport brought a lot of new viewers, not just from uh, the black community, but from, you know, all sorts of, you know, different places. Um, I, you know, hardly watched Formula One, no, because it seemed to just be the same thing in that you see that diversity, you know, taking place in the drivers, but, you know, you, know, you don't really see it in a visible way throughout the sport and you know if you take even women for example you know when you're seeing the visibility of women in formula one is you know tend to be associated with getting wet up with champagne and that kind of thing and you don't you don't really see this thing 
you know, you know, emerging kind of across, uh, you know, the, 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 in, in serious roles within Formula One. Maybe, maybe it's just that I'm not seeing it, and you might tell me that it's actually there, but not that visible. But, but I, um, you know, I think if we're talking about, you know, competing in a turbulent environment, uh, my question would be like, um, you know, is there a desire on the part of Formula One to, to kind of have more diversity, you know, right across the piece? I mean, even it's, it's, it's slightly disappointing. I mean, you've been a fantastic panel. It's been brilliant. But it's slightly disappointing to say all males and all white males and no, no females, no, you know, black people. I sent... So is there a desire? I sent three emails to Susie Wolf, <laughs> two emails to, um, to Monisha Kaltenborn, and never got a response. It might be me, maybe the scare women, <laughs> but we tried, we tried. You should, have, you should have sent an email to Bernie's office because <laughs> in Bernie's office, all the lawyers are women. Uh -huh. <laughs> now that. In fact, his, right, his right-hand man is a woman. Yes, his right-hand man is a woman. But this is part of Formula One that you don't see. We've seen one or two women engineers getting up on the podium after a team has won. That's the tip of the iceberg. But in the background, Formula One, like most things in life, is run by women. Um, the organization of some of the teams is done by women, yeah. is it not? I mean, it's uh, legally speaking, uh, legal directors within the teams, there's, there's several of them I can uh, think of. Yeah, I, you know, I would say, you know, what drives the thinking within Formula One is um, results and teams, organizers, championship organizers, commercial rights holders are, from my experience, um, they, they, they don't care whether you're, what color you are, what size you are, what team you support, what gender you are, they don't care. The same with, dri you know, with, with a driver, you don't care, big, small, whatever, Eskimo. as long as they can perform. It's, it's the ultimate performance um, arena uh, from, from my experience. And, and it's an incredibly diverse, diverse world. You know, there's no way we could have run our team if we said, you know, you've got to be, you, you've all got to come from one place or, you know, it's just, just an impossibility. It's, it's incre it might not look it, but it is incredibly, um, uh, an incredibly diverse um, world. There's, there is no room for um, you know, morally there's no room in any case, but in reality there's no room because it's performance, everything is performance driven. It's as simple as that. And then there's Honda. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we have time for a couple of more questions and uh, I, I let our microphone helper to decide where to yes. distribute, so I don't want to take the blame for that. Oh, female question. <laughs> Keep the microphone, microphone next to you. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this evening because for, I don't think the mic is working. Okay. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, for, for past alumna and for Formula One finance, a brilliant evening. And um, so I just wanted to come back to the point that Graham made about Formula One being a team sport. So, of course, there is a huge uh, team behind every, uh, every team working together to make it a success. But uh, I think the main focus is on the two drivers who are at the forefront of it. And um, I think the most fierce battles for a championship have been between teammates like from St. Paul's era <coughs> to current championships. And we see that in the corporate world as well. So we have two brilliant uh, employees and one promotion. So um, is there anything we can learn about managing expectations and getting the top performance in the one in corporate world? Um, drivers, drivers, drivers are an interesting <laughs> species. Um, you know, we talked a bit before about is this a sport or is it a business? And, and, a, and the old adage is it's too much of a sport to be a business, and it's too much of a business to be um, to be a sport. Um, there is a huge sporting element, um, and there's a huge entertainment element and a lower, I said before, it's the greatest team game in the world. Um, everything that involves sport and entertainment has to have heroes and the obvious heroes in, in Formula One team are um, other drivers and, and they are an odd uh, bunch. Um, never ever ever get in a higher car with one. <laughs> um, 
And yes, you can learn things from um, from drivers, but it's it's interesting. You know, if we're looking at academic. There's, there's a lot of academic work on this mm -hmm. about um, uh, relationship between um, team principals and whether they had driving careers and um, and that kind of thing. And uh, you know, I think there's some interesting issues there of. of of whether that's cause or effect, um, uh, the the job of running a Formula One team is is not driving the car. That's that's an element, and it's and it's, and it's a, a, a part of it, and it's a very important part. Um, but what you know, you, what you will see, as you've mentioned before, is that, uh, and in particular at the moment in Formula One, a driver can pretty much only compete against his teammate. And also, he can pretty much only get things wrong. Um, you know, his job is to just do, is to allow the car to go to its maximum envelope that the, that the rest of the team have created for him. So when you go to a race, your car has an envelope. The bottom of the envelope is you don't even start <coughs> or you don't finish. And the top of the envelope is set very much by every other member in your team. And everybody's envelope is set differently, and some teams are down here, and they haven't got a chance of being um, first unless the drivers make a mistake somewhere else. And these guys tend not to make, or most of them, uh, tend tend not to make um, many mistakes. So, yes, you can learn from um, from a from a driver, but I think there's you have to put that driver's role and what they do into into um, into perspective. There's a there's a there's lots of, in fact, I was going to say, there's a gnarly old character in Formula One. There's a lot of gnarly old characters in Formula One that you'll see in every team, you know, um, been <coughs> involved in team management for years and years and years. And there's a term that they sometimes use for drivers, and they call them light bulbs. And, you know, they screw one into the cockpit, off it goes, and then you bring them back out. And, you know, and, and I think that that approach is a one that's, um, you know, probably, probably uh, uh, air built on just a bit of humour, but but also it, 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 it does uh, uh, under, um, underestimate the, the, uh, the ability that these people have. But I think when, you know, when we're looking at the relationship to wider business, it's actually, some of the linkages are actually quite, quite complex. And um, I think there are many things in a team that bring, bring success, and you need all of those, but you certainly need you need here as a gentleman at the back who said um, that he followed uh, Formula One because Lewis effectively offered something a little bit different. Um, just shows that what drivers can bring and, and because of the spotlight that they're in is, is more than just their, their driving ability. I would say last question and then uh, maybe get some drinks. Anybody disagree with that? <laughs> I'll be short. I have a question for Mr. Lolo. I've been working for two years in Formula Student and I really follow it the, what you do for saving money uh, without a lot of money. Maybe because I was trying to bring back the car from Brazil uh, not having the money yeah. in the same time. And uh, I want to ask you, what changed in terms of sponsorship now that mo uh, F1 is moving to pay TV? Because we have a smaller audience, maybe, yes. but more passionate audience. So uh, we have a lot of teams like McLaren, for example, with no title sponsor. Uh, it's really difficult now, and it, it will be worse the situation with PTBs in the future. Or do you think that there are some positive sides? Sponsorship, it's the same as everything else in, in, Form, in Formula One. Sponsorship is an area where you have to s solve problems. And um, in, in, in the old days, if you like, there was a need within the wider business world for primarily for brand visibility and therefore <coughs> paying, a, a, paying a motor racing team to put a sticker on the car um, made some sense and the biggest mistake for the person running the team is to think that's what you do to make money because like everything else and we talked before about the fact that things change so rapidly now so for a long period of time there was an industry where you, stuck a, you paid some money, you stuck a sticker on a car, and there were people that worked in teams who were world experts at putting stickers on, on cars. And of course, they're the worst people that you need in a, in a Formula One team when, when the environment's changing, because you know, it's like the dinosaurs, you'll die out. So 
certainly in, in our team, in a small team, our approach was never a one of sponsorship. In fact, we, we tried everything to try and get rid of the word, but we just we couldn't in the end because it's, it's, it's used so widely. What you have to do is solve problems. So you, you build a partnership with a company and you solve problems for them. And their problem might be one of brand awareness. Now, from, from, from our point of view, if it was brand awareness, we, we said, look, we can't help you. Go and, see, go and see Ferrari. Their car is on the telly all the time. And uh, <laughs> you know, we can put a sticker on our car. It's completely pointless. But if there's something else that we can solve and you play to your strengths, so we were, we were in a position to be very flexible. Um, we are in a position where we could uh, create experiences for partners that, the bigger t that were too difficult for the bigger teams um, to do. Um, but primarily we looked to see if we could solve a big business problem, maybe one of product distribution or something like that. And creating a business network where you solve problems and then you take a percentage of that ecosystem if that, is that sort of business ecosystem that you've created and that you sit at the centre of, ideally, and you use that to fund your racing activities, and that you know, and and you've, and it's difficult. That's the other thing. I know I said before that this is a simple industry, but trying to find how to help people is incredibly difficult. And the most important attribute you can have is the ability to listen. And. Uh, you sit with people, you spend as much time with them as you can, and you listen, and then you solve problems. And we've done quite a lot of work with Formula Student, and the first question I always ask is, who's bringing the money in, and how are they doing it? And, um, and hopefully it's someone who listens, can identify a problem, work out how you can solve it, um, and ideally make a very large margin from doing it, and then you'll have some kind of um, stability to, to, your, to your income stream. And uh, so that, that was really the key sort of thing that we focused on. Well, on this uh, note, on this question, I think it's uh, time to thank our panelists. So, I think it's been a very engaging evening. Um, there, are, I'd like, so there are some people that definitely need to be uh, thanked today. Uh, well, first of all, our Dean, uh, Professor Marianne Lewis, for uh, her welcome and uh, endorsing these events. Uh, Scuderia Toro Rosso, our partner. Uh, again, if you're interested in knowing more about how to learn some of the things that you saw today in executive program bespoken for manager and executive, there's going to be a desk. Please leave your card or, you know, get some information. I would like to thank the School of Engineering, Mathematics and Computer Science of City University, here represented by Professor Roger Crouch and the team of uh, City University that are gonna have, gonna show you um, basically their car and also simulator, uh, racing simulator that you can try. It's the only case in which you'll be encouraged to drink and drive on the simulator <laughs> after they get the tube. Uh, our sponsor, City University, CAS Business School, the European Union Marie Curie Fellowship, the APSRC grant uh, through Professor Charles Baden Fuller and Professor Stefan Affliger, um, the Economic Office of the Embassy of Italy for their promotion, and believe it or not, there are more than 25 people that work from the staff to make this happen. It's a lot of work. I've been a pain in the last few weeks and not only. So I'd like to thank all of them. Their name appeared on the screen, but there are two or three people that I'd like to mention, which is Tanya Bukovic, Giselle Vaya, Julia Harry, and Margaret Nazim for their relentless help. And uh, finally, thank to you all for coming here today. Uh, hopefully this is going to be uh, uh, you know, a yearly event or a, a bi year event, and we're going to see each other again in a year or two with new ideas and new solutions, new lessons for Formula One. Thank you. Thank you.